numerology is infinite. You know, I talk about the life path, the life destiny, and the person in your cycles the most because I think if you know those three numbers, you can change your life. Like I've done it, I've seen clients do it. Like they're it's so powerful just knowing those three. But you can go even deeper and it gets more nuanced, probably take it a little more seriously and not see it as as woo woo. I don't think it's woo woo at all. I think this is like the instructions for the game. Yeah. That's what I always say. Yes. Numerology and astrology. It's the operating manual. Yeah. For absolutely. understanding what's happening in the game. So what you're saying is is fascinating because this bringing back or clearing of the karma. Mm, yeah, right? yeah. We were talking about your karma before. And yeah. death. <laughs> yeah. Death. And you have experienced okay. death twice. Oh, yeah. I forgot we talked about that. Yes, yes. I have, yeah. So can you tell us about that? Caitlin Carhart, what a pleasure to have you here with me. I'm so excited to talk numerology with you and astrology and all these things that you've literally blown my mind with in such a short time that we've known each other. Yeah. The first time we talked on the phone, I was like, okay, she's in a numerology <laughs> and I know a little bit about numerology. I just realized that I don't know jack shit compared to you do, to what you know in numerology. So I wanted to invite you on this show to have a really deep think tank discussion. Yeah, I love that. That's and I love what you're doing. I love that you're combining spirituality with math, which is basically what numerology is. It it totally is. And it's interesting you say that because that kind of leads right in to where I was hoping to go. Um, you know, as we look at math and most people think math is the sort of most objective of the sciences, the queen of the sciences. Mm -hmm. And we think about it as being so verifiable and rock solid and concretized and all that. But actually, math is also the most esoteric of all of the means of communication that we have. We can ascribe things to angel numbers. We can ascribe meaning. So numerology mm -hmm. to me is really about applying meaning mm. to the math. Yeah. Which makes it a lot more interesting to learn. Yeah. <laughs> and probably made it a lot easier for you to learn quickly. So can you tell me a little bit about your background and how you came into this whole notion of finding the meaning of math? How I got into numerology? Mm -hmm. Oh, man. Um, so this is going to sound a little woo-woo, but I feel like of all people, it's probably not that woo-woo to you, yes. especially after looking at your charts and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But numerology actually came to me in a dream. Many, many years ago, I had never heard of it, and I woke up in the middle of the night and I had heard in my dream, like spiritual numbers, spiritual numbers. And so I woke up and I was like, what the hell is that? And it was like three in the morning. I'm like online Googling like spiritual numbers and eventually came across numerology. And again, this was like a long time ago. This was before like this stuff was trending. Like astrology wasn't even that big. I don't think like mm -hmm. now you open up Instagram, it's everywhere. But this was like 2016. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I, I Googled spiritual numbers, found a numerologist in LA. And it's so weird. I emailed her and her response back to me was, how did you find me? And I was like, you're on like the 16th page of Google. Like I was looking for a numerologist. Um, anyway, she's like, I don't do readings, but I'll do one for you. And she had come from a long line of Indian mystics who had studied numerology. Like her mentor was literally a hundred years old living in India. And she would like call him and be like, like Vedic mathematicians. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Um, but anyways, I got on um, a call with her and at the time, like I didn't believe in astrology. I didn't believe in any of these things. Um, but in an hour, this woman knew pretty much everything about me. It was really mind blowing. And again, like numerology is very, very extensive. It's pretty much infinite, it's right? Crazy accurate, I yeah, found. Yeah, and crazy wow. accurate. And <clears throat> it's, it's again, like anything can be measured mathematically. And when you understand the language of numbers, which is really what numerology is, there's nothing that you can't really discover about yourself. And so again, I was just so mind blown and numerology became my obsession and my hobby. And at the time I was, I was working as a musician, I was a signed musician. And so I started bringing it into sessions where I'd be like, Hey, when's your birthday? And all of a sudden I'd be blowing people's minds. And I just kept doing that and accidentally built a business and clients <clears throat> and paying in random house found me to write a book and the rest is history, I guess. So yeah. Wow. <laughs> and so you become this whole numerologist to the stars. Mm -hmm. You work with a lot of people that are in very big positions of power and influence. Yeah. And um, 
do you find that they seek you out or is it that, and what is it about them that, that causes them to seek you out? Is it they, they just somehow know that numerology is a, is a thing and it's very accurate or is it that they've something they've often very much known a lot about already? Mm. I think, and I say this a lot, we live in a numeric system. There's not a day that goes by that you're not interacting with numbers or math to some extent, even if it's just as simple as you're buying groceries and you see numbers or you're driving behind a car and you see a specific number on a license plate. And I tend to find that whether you're into numerology or not, there's not a person I've met that doesn't have some sort of like, oh my God, there's this one number I always see. And so I think that people recognize that and it kind of draws them into numerology, even if they don't know what it is. And then, you know, usually people will like find my Instagram or they'll be referred through clients already. And they're like, oh my God, how is this so accurate? And so, <coughs> yeah, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure like, again, it's just like everyone's fascinated with numbers. <coughs> Excuse me. So, so what's your number? I want to know what's the number you always see. For me, what's so interesting, so again, I'm very skeptical and I always was skeptical even before numerology came into mm -hmm. my life. But one of the things that kind of sold me on numerology when I first got into it was that my numbers are a series of ones and 11s. And it wasn't that I always saw ones and 11s, but I thought that was super interesting that within my own cosmic code and numerology is based on your birthday. So your life path is one as well. Yeah, yeah, just like you. Mm -hmm. But you have that 19 that we were talking about that's attached to your life path. Which, Karma, karmic yeah, debt. Which we can, <laughs> we can dive a little deeper into again. Um, yeah, totally. But then what was interesting was like, I took it a step further even beyond just numerology and my initials are KK, K is the 11th letter of the alphabet. So 11, 11, oh, and then I was born at 10, 10 PM. I was born on the 11th. So it went on and on and on. And so again, it was just so interesting to see what I call, you know, your cosmic code, which is really your numerology chart. And each one of us has a very um, specific set of numbers that make up who we are similar to a thumbprint. Mm -hmm. And I've looked at thousands of charts at this point, and every single person is completely different and unique. Wow. Okay. So <laughs> what <laughs> happened when you first started figuring out uh -huh. this relationship you had with the number one? Oh. Well, for me, what was interesting, and, and you can tell me um, if you experienced this too, one is the leader archetype. It's the innovator. Um, it's highly, highly creative. It's really here to um, lead people where they haven't gone before. Mm -hmm. And you're a one as well. But growing up, I never wanted to be seen. I never wanted to mm -hmm. be a leader. I always kind of wanted to be like the guitar player with mystique. Like, you know, mm -hmm. I was playing in bands all my life and I would like want to hide in the back. I didn't want to mm -hmm. sing. I didn't want to be front and center. So when I discovered that I was a life path one and I'm a life destiny one as well. So it's that double one energy coming in again. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, well, even when I don't want to lead and I don't want to be seen, I'm somehow thrust into leadership roles or thrust into being seen in the spotlight. So maybe I play with that. Maybe I try to see what happens when I do that. Maybe my life will flow a little bit better. Right. Mm -hmm. And it did. And I'm sure you found too, the more that you step out as a one, the more things kind of like you are meant to lead. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I've, I've resisted it at times, but yeah, <laughs> I don't know why. I feel the need to resist it sometimes because I don't really like being the leader. It's yes, funny. There's but that's, a... that's what I find when you discover what your life path is. A lot of the times. <coughs> I'm having a throat chakra <laughs> attack right now. I don't even know why. <laughs> Maybe there you're must being... be something karmic going on right now. Maybe you're being activated. <coughs> I think I probably am. <laughs> you're my a Skywalker and World Bridger coming together. Oh my goodness. Well, the last time this happened was I was in Egypt. And all of a sudden, I laid in the sarcophagus. Uh huh. And Shervin, who you know, yeah, yeah, was outside because I took him there for his birthday. I lay in the sarcophagus, and I had just seen the face of Orion on the wall. Mm -hmm. I lay in the sarcophagus, and all of a sudden, I start coughing uncontrollably, like it's some sort of I couldn't stop coughing. Wow. It was the weirdest thing. And then my throat was burned, totally burned. Yeah. I couldn't speak all week wow. after that. It was the weirdest. Maybe most you're having thing. a throat chakra activation again because it's that Mayan thing we were talking about before. It could well be because <laughs> right numerology. after that I had this huge download. <laughs> yeah. And it was exactly about that. And I even measured 
my radiation to my throat because I had a Geiger meter with me and it was way higher than the rest of my body. Wow. So something definitely, so maybe you're activating me somehow. Yeah. It, it's the Catwoman outfit, I think. Yeah. That's what it is. It's a fair. <laughs> yeah. Robert was referencing me being a, a superhero earlier. And I was like, you well, You definitely dress. look like you could be a superhero. <laughs> 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 or perhaps a villain. Yeah. You could be the villain too in the black. Yeah. Which, which I'm one, very which, much which a sounds superhero. Cooler for you. Well, I'm flying to London tomorrow, everyone. So, you know, most of my things are packed. And I was like, this is comfortable. I, I like the look. The look is cool. You definitely came. And I recruited you to be part of our superhero team. So yeah. definitely I recognize somehow you are, you could be like a comic book character. You know that. Really? Oh, f- <laughs> Totally. You look like a comic book character, but it's not like the things that normally it's like, okay, what do you do? I can burn things with my eyes. I can fly, you yeah. know, I can like jump time dimension. You're like, I'm a numerologist. I just do math. I just do math. And read charts obsessively. I'm yes, like a, you do. I'm a little cosmic detective. Yeah. You really are. No, it's yeah. kind of insane. Yeah. It's so, this is like a superpower for you. Yeah. It truly is. And I appreciate it because... I also am adept at this language of number. I mm. see it as a musical thing. It's all very beautiful to me. It's like, mm-hmm. wow. Yeah. And it's all around. Everything is beautifully patterned. There's nothing that's not patterned. Yeah. It's just we can't perceive all the patterns. Well, that's what I tell everybody that everything in this world is cyclical. Like even nature is cyclical. So why would humans not be? And that's the thing. Like when you unlock numerology or again, your cosmic code, you start to understand your patterning. And when you understand your patterns, you can, for lack of better words, hack them, right? Like, again, we were just talking about the personal year cycles. And that's like, in my opinion, the greatest way to hack your life and understand your patterns. And when you start to track your cycles and you see, oh my God, I do the same exact things in the same exact year cycles, it'll blow your mind. You won't even realize how patterned you are as a being because you think, oh, each year is different. I'm different. I'm doing new things. But really, we're doing a lot of the same things in the same year cycle. So again, when you have that so knowledge. So when you say year cycle, that would be like, you could take this year and subtract mm-hmm. nine from it. Mm. And then the year that you experienced nine years before is gonna be similar to the one you're in now. Yeah, so <clears throat> numerology cycles are based on your birthday. So just your month and your day, and you add that together, you reduce that to a single digit, and then you add that to the current year, right? So mm-hmm. we're in 2024. So when I add up May 16th and then add that to 2024, that reduces down to two, which is why you're in a personal year two. Mm-hmm. And the last time you were in a personal year two was 2015, and that's because 2015 was the last universal year eight right so again it's right. all mathematical mm-hmm. based so it's very simple and easy to understand and again numerology runs in nine year cycles and then there are month cycles that run alongside the year cycle themes so again you can track back and see there is a parallel between 2015 and, and 2024 and there's also a parallel between 2014 and 2023 and even if you don't think that there is i guarantee if you go back and you look at your emails your social media your photos um, again, anything that will draw your memory, you will see some sort of similarity. And I've even tracked yeah. for people where they're doing the exact same thing on the same days in the same year cycle. Yeah. <coughs> wow. It's pretty, it's pretty wild. And again, like this isn't planned. Like we're not live. Most people are not living their lives looking to the future based in nine year increments. That's not really how the human mind is like no we don't think of it like that but no i've noticed the pattern of it yeah for sure i've noticed that and i could go back to 18 years ago and see the pattern and sometimes because i'll have something episodic that shows up like maybe in 2015 or 2014 Mm. that doesn't seem to resonate with exactly right now yet until i can see it in the retrospect yeah but then if i go back 18 years i could see the pattern Mm -hmm. and it does match yeah and it's crazy too because when you start to see that for example if I'll use myself as an example. I noticed that every time I went to a year four, I would go through breakups. Now, year fours are not a love year. It's not a breakup year, um, but it's a year of foundations. And when I realized that year fours were when I went through breakups, I realized, <clears throat> oh, I was building my foundations on relationships in my life that weren't sturdy and stable. So I'd get into a year four, everything would get earthquaked, right? So now that I know that, my next year four... If I'm in a relationship, I'll make sure like, okay, my, this can't be like the foundation of my life and let me make sure we're really solid. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you don't necessarily go through that breakup. Right. So it's planning ahead or even, 
uh, there's a money year, right? We're actually in a universal year eight, which is the only number that has to do with uh, money in the material realm. But when I was in my personal year eight, I prepared for that six months beforehand because I knew that was going to be the best time for money for me. And it only comes every nine years. So six months before my last uh, personal year eight, I decided, <clears throat> okay, I want to offer courses. I, I want to do numerology reports. I want that to be more easily accessible for people. I started building out my business more. And then I launched everything in the eight and I quadrupled my income in my eight. And this isn't like a I'm special thing. Like I've helped many clients do that. And again, it's just like working with the energies that are most supportive for us. But again, like knowing like my year eight before that, I was a broke musician, you know, like <laughs> not a lot was going on. <laughs> so you, you need like a couple pennies to rub together to like make some money. I well, guess. not even just that. It's everything has light and shadow to it. Right. So it's mm -hmm. again like the the highest amplification of an eight is like you know, striking it rich or really leveling up with income. Uh, and the lowest expression of that, the shadow mm -hmm. side is, you know, you can go through an eight and file bankruptcy or again, it's all about how you're entering the cycle too, though. You know, like I, that's why I prepared for it before I went into it. Interesting. Knowing I wanted to make the most of the energy, which I know you follow astrology. Maybe it's kind of, mm -hmm. you do the same with transits. Like when you went to Egypt, that was during a specific transit, right? Yeah, it was 1212. Yes. And which was the Orion portal. Exactly. And um, I didn't even know that mm -hmm. when we planned. We didn't plan it that way at all. And oh, then, I thought you did. Oh, no. Wow. No, and not only that, okay. but for the first time in recorded history, there was an eclipse of Orion that day. Uh-huh. So there was a Leona 319 asteroid passed right in front of Betelgeuse or Betelgeuse, which then caused it to be occluded. Yeah. The day that we went to the Great Pyramid. Wow. <clears throat> and then when we were there, we came out of the pyramid and there was every place we went. We went to all three pyramids that night. We came out of the Great Pyramid and Orion was literally standing straight up on top of the Great Pyramid. And we wow. got this epic photograph of it. And then we went to the next pyramid. It was standing right there as well. Like the whole night it moved exactly to the position that we went to. And I was like, wow, that's pretty cool because I was like launching Orion. And then also Orion right now is in a big important shift because Betelgeuse is about to, they believe, Michio Kaku, the physicist, and Brian Cox have both come out last week and said they believe that uh, based on what they're able to analyze from the James Webb telescope is that there's new emissions coming out of it, which are then looking like it's going to be exploding quite soon, mm. turning wow. going supernova, Whoa. which is going to be, according to their description... Because uh, it's 764 times larger than the sun. It's going to be as large uh, as our entire solar system. The gas cloud of it. It's going to look like a giant rose. And we're, are we going to be able to see that? We'll be able to see it in the daytime what? and That's nighttime. That's crazy. And its brightness scale is going to be identical to the moon in full moon status. What? And we'll be able to see it during the day, just like we see full moons during the day. It'll be huge in the sky. It's what is that literally expected change. to happen? It could happen any day now, they're saying. But that Whoa. actually means, because it's 724 light years, you know, away from us. So yeah. therefore, for this to happen right now, it actually happened in the year 1300. Whoa. That's crazy. It is. Wow. I hope I, hope I see that soon. <laughs> that sounds very exciting. Well, I mean, it could take another 10,000 years. They don't know. But yeah, they, yeah. they think based on the emissions coming off of it, the light emissions and what's spewing out of it, kind of like a volcano spews before it blows. Yeah. It's doing the same thing, and which is causing it to flicker. So if you look at the upper left shoulder star of Orion, mm -hmm. it looks orange red mm -hmm. right now, very orange red, and it's flickering in and out of brightness because all of this spew ash stuff that's coming out of it is occluding it. Mm -hmm. And and so it's close enough that they can observe it, and they 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 think it's going to explode. Wow. Wow. Which will be, <coughs> which will be epic. Yeah. And by the way, Orion is responsible for the throat chakra. Yeah. Well, that makes sense, especially with... It's in Taurus. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, which you're a Taurus. And Taurus is the neck, and why? Yeah. Because of the cerebellum. Yeah. Which is at the top of the neck, which is the cerebellum. Yeah. The cerebellum, bowl. and then you have the cerebrum ram... Which, yeah. is, which is the ram. Aries. Aries. Yeah. Exactly. Those are the two parts of the brainstem that basically create, you know, our experience yeah. that we're going into. So you can apply astrology to basically everything is what you're Oh, finding. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the throat. Well, you can look at the entire Nile 
And all the way from Abu Simbel, all the way up to where the Nile empties into the Mediterranean, it's each of the temples is a different chakra. Mm -hmm. It's a spine of Osiris. Yeah. And then it, the, the Nile tributaries and Delta basically split into the lotus flower. Yeah. And the throat chakra is at the Giza Plateau. Yeah. And that's why it's called Bull Mountain. Yeah. That makes sense. It does. And the original name of the Giza Plateau is not Giza. It's Ross Tau. It's Taurus backwards. Yeah. I feel like if people were taught astrology in the way that you explain it and you show again like how astrology is playing out in all these different ways again just the vertebrae that you even were describing i think a lot of people would probably take it a little more seriously and not see it as as woo woo i don't think it's woo woo at all i think this is like the instructions for the game yeah that's what i always say yes numerology and astrology it's the operating manual yeah, for absolutely. For understanding what's happening in the game. Numerology, astrology, the 52-card deck thing as well. Yeah, yeah. When oh, Katy Perry did that reading for me, I was mm -hmm. like blown away yeah. how accurate it was. I was three of diamonds. Yeah, with a seven of hearts PRC. With a, okay, can you explain yeah. what that means? So the PRC, I like, it's, it's a planetary ruling card. So I look at the PRC kind of like your rising sign. And actually, um, a lot of people who are in a cardamoncy they think that the PRC is just as important as the birth card. So so PRC sounds like the People's Republic of China. Yeah. But... <laughs> it's your planetary ruling card. Mm -hmm. But what I like about the card deck, which I rarely talk about, but I do work with all the time, especially with timing, because it's in 52-day periods, which is that's a whole other conversation. But what I like about the card deck is that it actually is numerology and astrology combined together. Like when you go into it, like you have Jupiter cards, you have Mercury cards, all of that. And mm -hmm. even your time periods, like right now you're in a Uranus 52 day time period and Uranus is all about, well, you know, the themes of Uranus, but um, unexpected illusion. Yeah. But also unexpected opportunities coming right now. So between now and March 24th, there'll probably be a couple unexpected events. And then you go into your Neptune period. I just got an invitation today to speak in Nigeria. Whoa. Okay. To the, uh, African entrepreneur organization, which is like this big thing. Yeah. And I'm like, speak in Nigeria to the African entrepreneur. Thing. It was like, <laughs> of all things, like huge thousands of people event. And, and maybe that's kind of emblematic of what you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. And again, like what I, again, what I like about it is that it's, it's combining both systems, but in a very elementary way. Right. Cause it's all just coming down to one card in the 52 deck. But if you actually look into the 52 card deck, Again, it predates tarot. It was used in Egypt. Um, it was made by the, I learned this today. It was made by the Mamluks. Oh, I didn't know that. So the 52 card playing deck came from the Mamluk sultans. Uh huh. One of which was Kite Bay that hired Leonardo da Vinci and moved him to Cairo. Mm hmm. And actually, it was called Babylon at the time. Okay. The original name there was he was the Sultan of Babylon, which is a part of Cairo today. It's old Cairo. Mm hmm. Cairo is a relatively new name. Yeah. Babylon was the original name. That makes sense. And the original name of the Nile was not the Nile. It was the Gihon River, the same one that matches the river that comes out of the Garden of Eden. Wow. Which was established yeah. by <clears throat> this uh, Babylon was supposed to be established by Orion. Yeah. In the Bible, his name was Nimrod. Okay. And he was supposed to have built the Tower of Babel. Yeah. And we think we found it. Really? Mm -hmm. It's going to be exciting. It's on one of the upcoming episodes is going to be in my show but also on ancient civ on um on gaia oh my god so it's very very cool uh, i need to watch this <laughs> it's epic this is really epic stuff but i won't go more into that but the thing is is that it's all connected to this stage of where we are in the world right now because i think orion actually just represents humanity yeah right now it's a reflection of humanity it always has been along the hero's journey of humanity. Mm -hmm. And we're going through a massive shift right now. A lot of people have predicted a lot of crazy stuff for 2024. Yeah. And what are your thoughts for 2024? Well, from a numerological point of view, there are gonna be a lot of shifts in our financial institutions and the way we interact with money. Again, we're in a universal year eight and eight is the only number that has to do with money and power in the material realm. So a lot of shifts with money, which you can, I feel like you can see with things that are shifts that are going on with <coughs> banks, mm -hmm. all this stuff with crypto. Um, and then again, eight is also the number of power. So a lot of uh, kind of like power structure shifting, like who has the power in, in our world? 
And I think a lot of that is changing. I think a lot of people woke up last year because last year was a year of spiritual awakenings. It was a seven. Mm -hmm. Seven is very deeply spiritual number. Um, We were talking about that before. And now that people kind of have gone inwards and had these sort of spiritual awakenings and epiphanies, now it's kind of time to apply it, right? So that's really what I see for this year from a numerological perspective, but also uh, Pluto just moved into Aquarius, which we also were talking Mm. about. And that's... Rebellion. Yeah, that's a really big deal. You know, Pluto has not been in Aquarius since basically the American Revolution. So that also kind of just echoes what numerology is saying, which is, again, like structure, our power structures are going to be shifting tremendously. Um, And I think there's going to be a lot of people coming forward with more innovations. So, again, I think it's like a really powerful time for someone like you to come forward with all of your findings and to actually have people take it seriously. I think that's kind of that energy of Pluto and Aquarius is that now people can actually uh, digest it. Whereas before people maybe weren't so interested, but now people are hungry for that level of information. And I'm even seeing it with numerology and astrology. I don't know if you are with your own work, but. Oh yeah, yeah. definitely. A couple of years ago, people weren't really that interested in, in this stuff. And now it's, it's like. It's exploding now, yeah. Yeah, it's really wild to see. It is because it seems like before I'd have to convince a lot. (laughs) You know, I'm like, okay, a bit of this, a bit of that, trying to get people to understand, okay, here's how the numbers work and everything. And be like, yeah, that seems a little weird. But now they're they're like lapping it up. Yeah. It's wild. I'm even noticing um, a shift in the people that are uh, finding me online. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, like, of course, a couple of years ago, it was mostly like the astro girlies, you know, like women who are super in astrology who are like, numbers are cool. And now I'm having so many like straight dudes, like straight up bros, like coming in like, yo, I use numerology all the time. Like, that's my jam. I'm like, oh, OK, cool. You know, it's just like getting to all these different um demographics i guess and and i just did a live event actually and there are people tuning in from like turkey and china and australia and i'm like how are y'all even finding me like all over the world but again i think i mean you know math brings everyone together it's it's the universal language math and music which music really is math absolutely yeah in fact it's the left lobe temporal lobe of the brain is math Mm -hmm. it's where we process math and the right temporal lobe is where we process music yeah so it's literally mirrored of each other, mirrors of each other, and then the center is geometry. Yeah, geometry is just the music we experience with our eyes. Whoa, I really like that. Is that a, is that a phrase you say often? Yes. Oh, I was like, I just tossed that shit out there. <laughs> I was like, it. whoa, that was brilliant. Your throat chakra just activated, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> and here it came through. You channeled it. But no, I always it's cool to talk to you about this too. And we've spoken, you know, before. But a lot of people think it's strange that. You know, I was a musician and now I'm this numerologist, but I'm like, music is the same thing. That just shows how balanced you are. Yeah. Thank you. And I've listened to your music too. I've seen your videos and everything. They're they're awesome. Thanks. Yeah. So you're definitely a talented musician. So it makes sense that you've just gone into the esoteric side. Yeah. The the, the other side of the scale, I guess, of, of mathematics. Yeah. And again, music is also just a series of patterns and it's numerologically based, Mm -hmm. right? It's like, okay, I know that if I'm going to play a major chord, it's going to be one, three, five. Here's the root note. Okay. Let me go up three steps, five steps. Exactly. So it's, everything is just pattern recognition. It's very simple when you actually think about it and, and how all the musical intervals work, Mm -hmm. it is quite simple. You can just count it. It's like the the number of white keys along the piano keyboard. And that's going to tell you, you know, whether you're a perfect fifth or a fourth or a third or seventh or whatever. And then the two will always sum to nine. Yeah. So the inverted pairing of a fourth is a fifth. Yeah. The inverted pairing of a third is a sixth. Yeah. Right. So then you just flip the polarity from major to minor. Yeah. So it's just like a positive or negative polarity shift. Yeah. Well, nine is such a magical number too. Completion. Yes, exactly. That it represents completion in numerology. I sometimes also call it the death number. Um, Because when you're in a a personal year nine, there's a lot of endings, right? But again, like death is just a new beginning. But what's cool about the nine is that if you add nine to any single digit number and then you reduce that number, it will come out to that number, right? So it's like nine plus six will reduce to six. Like it didn't exist. Yeah. It acts like zero. Exactly. 
Isn't that fascinating? That's why nine can both take the property of one mm -hmm. and zero. Yeah. So if you take point nine 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 repeating, mm -hmm. there's a mathematical proof that shows that point nine 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 repeating actually is one. Yeah. It's it's not different than one. So point nine 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 becomes the number that can be a superposition number. Mm -hmm. It can act both as one or zero in binary code. Yeah. And so zero to the power of zero equals one. Yes. Right, because, and that's absolutely proven because it becomes 0.99999. You, you go with 0.5 to the power of 0.5 equals 0.707. Mm -hmm. But 0 0.05 to the power of 0 0.05, we're getting smaller, mm -hmm. equals 0.86. Interesting. 0 0.0005 to the power of 0 0.0005 equals 0.98. And then you go point zero zero, put 10 zeros in there. Yeah. Put 10 zeros and then the five at the end. And it becomes point nine 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 nine. Wow. So. Oh, you know what's <clears throat> interesting, actually? Another thing about the nine. To one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I remember I did a deep dive on gurus. Mm -hmm. You know, people, I can't remember. Like, who was the one who wrote that autobiography of a yogi? That's uh, Paramahansa Yogananda. Yeah. So there are a couple of different, you know, gurus that have occurred throughout history where they started off with mm -hmm. one name and mm -hmm. then when they became enlightened, they changed their name. They changed their name. And every time I've decoded one of them, their entire cosmic code is nines. And all of a sudden their karmic numbers, because you can see in numerology your, your karma, your karmic debts and your karmic lessons, um, which also kind of informs us of our previous lifetimes or what is time. But you know what I'm saying, our mm -hmm. other incarnations, but their entire cosmic code just becomes nines. Isn't that wild? And also nine is completion. So that would make sense that as an enlightened being, all, a series of nines would be your final code. So when they change their name? Yeah. They change it to nine. <laughs> well, I don't think that they're nines. even recognizing it because it's every single number becomes a nine and all of a sudden all their karma becomes zero and gets cleared. Interesting. Right? That really blew my mind. I found that out like 2017. I just was like, I'm going to decode gurus. And it's so wild to see that sort of patterning because it's very rare because usually when you look at someone's numerological makeup, it's a series of like so many different numbers. Just like with astrology, we all have all the signs. Most people have most of the numbers. So it's very, very rare when someone's chart is mostly one number. Interesting. So in my case, mm -hmm. I went to a Sikh wedding mm -hmm. right, where they wear turbans and everything. Yeah. And people were coming up to me because my first time going to a Sikh wedding and they're like, oh, your name is the name of our Bible. And I was like, really? My name is the name of your Bible? Robert? Grant. Oh. And so I said, what's the name of your Bible? They said, well, in Sikhism, they abandon the concept of gurus. So they have only one guru. And the one guru is their holy book. And their holy book is called the Guru Grant Sahib. Wow. So guru comes from dark. So gu means dark, ru means light. Uh huh. So light emerging from darkness is guru. Wow, I had no idea, that's so cool. Mm-hmm. Wow. So guru grant is also gurant again, the same thing, light yeah. emerging from darkness. Sahib is just an honorify, you know, you add an honorific aspect to it. Kind of like we say sama in Japanese or something after, yeah. you know. And so I was like, everywhere I went, they're like, oh, Guru Granth Sahib. I was just laughing about it because I had no idea. It's actually written um, G-R-A-N-T-H, but the H is silent. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. So what you're saying is, is fascinating because this bringing back or clearing of the karma. Mm, yeah, right? yeah. We were talking about your karma before. And yeah. death. <laughs> death and you have experienced oh, death yeah. twice oh yeah i forgot we talked about that yes yes i have yeah so can you tell us about that the first time you're only one and a half year old, yeah. years old the first time <clears throat> it's funny though because the first time i had a near-death experience um i that was my first memory but i didn't know what it was and i had dreams like my whole life of sitting at the bottom of a pool looking up and a man diving in to like get me basically. And uh, I remember I brought it up to my mom when I was like 10. She's like, oh yeah, you drowned when you were little. Like you just jumped in the, the end of the pool and nobody was watching you. I was like, what? And I was able to accurately <laughs> describe um, what the man looked like. Um, 
but then the the other one that happened when I was 15, I actually remember very, very vividly. And I was surfing um, off the North Shore of Oahu. And I took a wave in and it was very, very hot that day. So once I got closer to shore, I decided to hop off my board and like dunk in the water. It was so hot. And when I came up from being under, um, I turned and there was a boy from the surf school who didn't really know how to surf on a surfboard coming straight at me the force of a wave which you know how powerful that is <clears throat> and the surfboard hit me right here and knocked, knocked me down mm-hmm. yeah and um so i drowned and the interesting thing about that again i remember it so well is that when i was drowning i obviously was very panicked for air and i remember looking up but i was so disoriented because i had been hit like right near my temple um in the head I, I couldn't even I didn't even know what direction was up and I was fighting for air and then there came a moment where and I know that sounds strange it's really really hard to describe but there was a very strong feeling of peace and calmness and just like oh I'm okay and mm-hmm. then it's like I didn't have to breathe anymore it's like I was at the bottom of the ocean, but I mm-hmm. air was irrelevant. And all of a mm-hmm. sudden, this panicked feeling kind of stopped. And then I was fine. And you thought, okay, I'll just go to the light. Yeah, basically. And then I was pulled out um, from there and resuscitated. Wow. So what happened while you were gone? I it was weird. It was kind of like just very... There weren't a lot of visuals. It was very murky and just the most intense feeling of love and calmness just like no worries at all like I wasn't thinking about me as Caitlin Carehart I I wasn't feeling a body it was just like pure bliss I know a lot of people describe that but it really did feel like that and it was very like warm feeling what year was this this was this was sometime in like 20 10 ish maybe yeah so you didn't like wake up in a room with everyone wearing like white clothes and they no, said put I, it back in 2010 no i was on the i was on the <laughs> oh no 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 um and i was also on the beach right so the surfing instructor of the kit and, and everyone was like panicked because they were like oh we're gonna get sued and like he got me out of there and like when i came back to i like my face was deformed because i'd been hit in the head and um i am partially deaf because of it so but I was telling you that even though I'm partially deaf in my left ear, I feel like there are certain tones that I can hear much stronger that aren't like the more present tones in, in music and in people's voices. And like, I'll be out and people are like, how the hell did you hear that? But like, do you hear that drum? That's that line. Did it? And they're like, how do you hear that? I don't hear that. And you're partially deaf. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. So it's pretty wild. But again, like it made me, I don't want to say that I, don't fear death at all because I think it's human instinct that if we're in a situation, like we're going to fight to not die. But there's this feeling of like, it's almost like I know it's going to be okay. If that makes sense. Because of that peaceful love feeling. So what is this world in your opinion? What are we living in? This world? I think we're living in a simulation. Okay. Expand on that, please. You and I have talked about this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. I'm like, wait, because you can like, go there. <laughs> yeah, you can do it. I was like, wait, a, dude, I remember this one time I was, <coughs> I was lying in bed at my parents' house mm-hmm. um, and I had taken like a melatonin CBD gummy Yeah. and I was just like really relaxed. And all of a sudden I was like, oh my God, it's so obvious. We live in a, we live in a simulation. That's why numerology works. And then I messaged you yeah. and I said, Hey Robert, we live in a simulation. Don't we? You're like, yes. I was like, okay. And then we got on a phone and we talked totally. about yes. the fact that we live in a mm-hmm. simulation. But did it, wasn't there also some study or something that just came out? Yeah. I mean, the, well, it was the Nobel Prize. Yeah, there we go. Nobel Prize in 22 was for quantum entanglement, which proved that the universe is not locally real. Yeah, exactly. And the, the Nobel Prize winners proved it. Yeah. So if you're not observing something, it doesn't actually exist. Isn't that so wild to think about? Yeah, it doesn't have a position, is what it's called. Yeah. In physics and math. So that means that everything is just a figment of our perception. Yeah. And I think that numerology are the codes to the matrix the matrix that we live in. 
And I think that astrology is also a component of that, which we've talked about. And so we go on this cycle of life. Mm -hmm. And have you found patterns between incarnations of people so that they would have certain numbers? Yeah, actually, you know what's really interesting is that I've decoded a lot of families so like a lot of people will come to me and they'll have a reading and they'll love it so much. They're like, mm -hmm. oh my God, you've got to talk to my mom. you got to talk to my dad and my brother. Mm -hmm. um, and I found that when it comes to karmic debt, a lot of the times like pe all people in the same family unit will all have the same karmic debt number, which would be interesting to even decode like your family and see if they have the same debt number that you have. Although yours is like pretty rare and very specific. Um, is mine very rare? I would say so, um, for sure, this actually. This is a 19. Yeah, yeah. So a, I'm a 19 life path one. Yeah, exactly. So there are only four karmic debt numbers. Um, and 19 is a pretty rare one just because, like we were talking about before, 19 means there was an abuse of power in a past lifetime. And huge, huge, <laughs> huge abuse of power. Not like, you know, again, oh, well. wow. not, not like you were, you know, you know, a asshole to someone on the road something like that it was like you abused a no lot of i was people. definitely like i know I, yeah i remember yeah exactly so like you were like napoleon and you abused you know a lot of people you impacted a lot of people negatively and so that in this lifetime you have to impact that many people positively and when you're impacting thousands upon thousands of people it's hard to be able to do that in a positive way if you don't have some level of fame. So a really good example of this is Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise <clears throat> is a life path one as well and has that 19 karmic debt attached to his one. Um, and I really can't think of a more famous person. Like his face is recognizable across the world. And again, like he, I don't know what his abuse of power is, um, but in this lifetime, he's you know positively impacting people through his films and, and all of that, right? <clears throat> mm -hmm. So... But most of my clients who have a 19 karmic debt are famous. And again, it's designed that way because how else are they going to be able to impact that many people? Wow. Okay. Yeah. So, so if you, you have went that. through each of the, so if you went through each, like a, like a speed dating thing almost and said, mm -hmm. okay, life path one, what are they like? Yeah. So uh, life path one, life path two, life path three, all the way up mm -hmm. through the master numbers too. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, there are master numbers. You know, you know what you're talking mm -hmm. about. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'll just do it really quickly because this can take a long time. So Life Path 1 is the innovator, the creative pioneer. So this is like the Steve Jobs, Martin Luther King, uh, Junior, Tesla. You know, you're here to innovate. That's what you are, by the mm -hmm. way. So one. Then we have the Life Path 2s, which are the empaths. And so are you, by the way. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> and then we have the Life Path 2s, which are the empaths and the diplomats. Uh, that's like the Tony Robbins, the Eckhart Tolle. Um, then we have life path three, which is communication and self-expression. These are really the artists in our society. So most actual prominent actors and musicians are threes, like Katy Perry's a three, mm -hmm. um, Ed Sheeran, Christina Aguilera, Larry David, it, a lot of writers are threes. Again, it's communication. Then we have four, which is the builder. Uh, they're here to, again, build some sort of structure or company or, you know, it's the four energy. It's that builder <clears throat> energy mm -hmm. foundation. So these are the Oprah's and the, for some reason, I can only remember Quentin Tarantino as a four as well. Um, then we got five, which is about all about freedom and mm -hmm. um, change. The five rides this constant wave of unexpected changes throughout their lifetimes. So they're really here to teach us how to be adaptable. So these are like Russell Brand is a five. If you look at his career, it's like, whoa, there's a lot of changes. Very unconventional. Mm -hmm. Um, then we got six, which is the nurturer. Um, they're also kind of the visionaries. They're here to balance a stable, loving home life with careers. So like Victoria Beckham, Jessica Alba, they're both, you know, family women, but also boss ladies. Then we got the seven, which is like the most spiritual number. This is the philosopher. So Bruce Lee is a really good example of that. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's a grounded spirituality, the seven, mm -hmm. um, then we have the eight, which is the powerhouse. So this is the high achiever. That's all about power and money and mastering the material realm. Um, Stevie Nicks, <coughs> Elizabeth Taylor, mm -hmm. uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Then we have nine, which is the humanitarian. So that's Mother Teresa, Gandhi, the yogi that we talked about earlier, who wrote that autobiography. Mm -hmm. um, and again, they're just here to be the humanitarians and to make the world a kinder, gentler place. And then we have the master numbers, 
which are the master teachers. And these are very rare. So we have uh, 11, which is the psychic. So this is like kind of the antipode to the seven. It's very spiritual, but from a cosmic lens, very, very psychic. And they're here to be spiritual thought leaders. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of inventors are 11s, actually, like Pharrell's an 11. So he's channeling it through music. Can't think of any other ones right now. And then we have um, we have 22, which is the most powerful number in numerology. That's the master builder. So that's like the four on steroids. Uh, that's Paul McCartney, Richard Branson, also Matthew McConaughey. And then we have Life Path 33, which is 33 is uh, Christ consciousness and unconditional love. And that is honestly the rarest number that I've seen. And um, Steve Irwin was one. And I think that's a really good example if you ever Crocodile watched. Hunter. Yes. <clears throat> but he was he was such like an animal lover. He was, he was. so sweet. Was like so sad. I know it's real I mean, I remember watching that though when I was a kid being like, I don't think this is gonna go well. Because he was just grabbing onto these animals, you know? And yeah, I was like at one the, point uh, the stingray barb to the heart. That's sad. It's yeah. terrible. Yeah. Oh. But I mean, look, it doesn't matter. Everyone's gonna die. It doesn't matter how we die. What matters is how we live. Yes. That should be on a bumper sticker. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, that's all the life paths broken down. Wow. So if you were then to overlay that with, say, a life path one and a Taurus, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what would that be? How does it change the, uh, the equation? It's interesting because I've <clears throat> tried to find correlations between numerology and astrology in that way and kind of see like what numbers link up with what signs the way that's interesting because taurus is from the bull which is the aleph yeah which is the number one yeah well that makes sense you're really embodying that one energy hmm. yeah but what i think when i look at astrology when i look at numerology like when i when i'm sitting with someone and I'm decoding them. I'm looking at all the systems that we've named before. And I'm like, okay, what's your astrology? What's your numerology? What's your, you know, 52 card deck and your Maya? They're all saying the same thing, but in their own unique way, right? Like I'll look at human design to understand energetically how you're moving through the world. But I'll look at your numerology to understand who you are at a baseline. Like I always start with numerology because I think math is just everything, right? Mm -hmm. Numbers are like we said, the universal language, and it's like where I'm going to build from. So I'll start with numerology and then I'll pull in from other systems to kind of be like, okay. And when every single system is kind of echoing the same thing, like I looked at your astrology chart earlier and I've looked at your numerology and it's like, you're a leader archetype, you're here to innovate, and it's echoed in so many different placements in your, in all charts, right? So again, I think that's also helpful to look at because Let's say, for example, you're like, hey, I don't really fuck with numerology. It's not for me. Well, we can look at other systems and be like, well, they're all kind of saying the same thing, you know, but through their own lens. And it's kind of cool when you can kind of speak those different languages because people do have preferences. But I think so far what I've noticed, maybe because I am a numerologist, um, people take more to numerology because we're already familiar with numbers. So it's kind of easier, right, to be like, oh, yeah. Your life path money, just add this up. People are like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Have you noticed any combinations of life path types that work well together? Oh, yeah. Like in relationships, for example? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, I have a whole section in my book about that, actually. Um, I will say that when you meet someone who's your same life path number, you literally are on the same wavelength as them, right? Because numbers are just and vibrating at a specific frequency, right? That's what all these are. So that's always really compatible even just like as friendships right i have a lot of ones in my mm -hmm. life and it's mm -hmm. like whenever i hang out with a one i just know it because there's mm -hmm. just like such camaraderie it's like back and forth back and forth mm -hmm. i don't get drained um but there are definitely numbers that you'll find you are much more compatible with for like sure. which ones for example for a one life path one for a one d definitely the five Ones and fives go so well together. And that's because the five rides this constant stream of change. But so does the one. The one is constantly innovating and constantly having new beginnings, right? The one is 
the initiator. So throughout your life, I'm sure you've noticed, you're like always starting a new project, always on to the next thing. And not a lot of people can keep up with that kind of energy. It can feel chaotic to other numbers. Whereas the five is the same way. They're not always initiating the change, but their lives are always constantly changing because again, our life path is what we're teaching others. So a five is here to teach us how to be adaptable and to get comfortable with change and to develop um, our own relationship with freedom. Whereas the one is here to teach others how to lead and how to be innovative. Like, oh, you're doing it this way? No, we're gonna do it that way, right? The one is kind of like rules are made to be broken. I'm gonna go at it my way and I'm gonna lead the charge, right? So ones Pretty and much. fives go super, super well together. Any other combinations? For ones or just in general? Yeah, ones and nines or ones and eights or any of the other ones. Ones and eights <clears throat> go really well together. But the interesting thing about ones and eights is that ones and eights are the biggest like leader archetypes uh, in the numbers. So sometimes it's like... Battle for power type thing. Exactly, right? And sometimes people want to be the star in the relationship. But when you're with an eight you're probably both going to be the star, right? So it just, it just depends on what you're looking for, right? I will say what's interesting about you is that your life path is a one, but your life destiny, which is based on your full legal birth name, is a four. And four is very opposite energy from a one. Like I would never usually say that a one should be with a four because the one is so innovative and the four is kind of like, the, it's not that the four isn't innovative. The four is kind of like, we're going to be methodical. We're going to be practical. There are rules that we need to follow. There are rules that are set into place and we're going to build based on these rules where the one is like, fuck the rules. I'm going to play this my way. So ones and fours tend to butt heads a lot, but you embody both of those. And I don't know if huh. maybe you feel that within you. Oh no, you. that's probably why I chose the career path I chose. Yeah. Which was way more traditional. Yeah. But I was always bucking up against it. Because I always was a rebel. I was always an outsider. Yeah. But somehow I could adapt to the st stricter environments mm -hmm. and I could deal with it somehow. Otherwise, I would have never chosen those fields. Yeah. Well, that makes sense because it's that four. That four mm -hmm. is like really crazy stability. And there's a little bit of like, again, the four is like super, super reliable, right? That's why it's the builder. It's mm -hmm. like everyone can rely on the builder where the mm -hmm. one is kind of like, Think about Steve Jobs, right? Like coming in, like, we're going to do this and then pissing everybody off. But then like, he's a genius. So everyone's like, all right, fine. We'll, <laughs> we'll tolerate you. Right. So you have a little bit of like both of those energies of like, and how about one and a nine? That's interesting. So I actually have a lot of nines in my life. What I find interesting about that relationship is that it's like bookends, right? It's like the one starts everything. It's new beginnings. It's innovative. And the nine is the closer and the ending. And so while ones are constantly like alpha and omega, exactly. While <clears throat> ones are always in this cycle of new beginnings and I want to do something new, what's next. The nine is like, I need to let go. I need to complete what what's ending. Right. But really, you know, was it Seneca who said every new beginning comes from some other beginnings end? Yeah, mm -hmm. so it's like the one and the nine, death is a rebirth, it's right? It's also a song. That's the end of a song. I'm trying to remember the, who sings that song, but it's a song. Wait, okay, so I remember that it's that, I know who I want to take me home, right? Yes, that one. Yeah, yeah. So I Googled those lyrics years ago, and I was like, what a great line. And then I realized it was, it was a, phil a philosopher's line. So I didn't realize he had taken who it. Who sings that? Is that who best... Uh... Matchbox 20? Maybe it's Matchbox 20, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm just like pulling that from my brain. I can't, I don't even know what Matchbox 20 is, but I'm like remembering the image of it playing. I'm pretty sure that's it. Um, but yeah, it's like the nine, while it's like the closer and it's all about letting go, it's the, the biggest difference though with the nine is that the nine it really is here to be the humanitarian and to make the world a, a kinder, gentler place and to like fight for a cause where the one is the only number that has to do with the self. So a lot of your life is actually focused on you learning and understanding yourself. So yeah, it's very yeah. true. And some people actually might, you know, have, have thought you were selfish or a little self-involved, but that actually is your path is to master yourself. Yeah. Right. So it's like, you are your greatest, um, I guess what you're studying. And then, like, it's funny, I did a documentary film and I said, the greatest encryption of all is to learn 
the cipher of the self. Exactly. But that really is like a huge part of your destiny here. Whereas other people like the nine, it really isn't here to master itself in that way. The nine is more about focusing on others. Like how can I bring up my community? It's kind of like um, Aquarian energy. Definitely. Okay. So then if we look at astrology for a second, so then if you did the same thing mm -hmm. that you just did, like the speed dating for each yeah. of the astrological signs, mm -hmm. what would you say? Oh, wow. Okay. So Virgin, 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 that's it's like a vegan Virgo. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, okay. Sorry. We're getting activated by a portal over here. I, something uh, you've definitely opened a portal. Yeah. I opened a portal on accident. Okay. Virgo. We need to come up with a superhero name for you too, by the way. Well, I'm a Virgo, so maybe it's Virgin. A Virgin. Virgin. A Virgin. <laughs> okay, so. Could you be like a twerking Virgin? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, there you go. <laughs> so, Virgo, I love how I started with Virgo. It's, it's mm -hmm. not, that's not where it starts, people, by the way. Uh, okay, so Virgo is the, the alchemist, the healer, the maiden. Um, then we got Libra, which is all about balance and partnership. It's the scales. We have Scorpio, which is all about depth and intimacy. It's the scorpion, so it's got that stinger. It can be spicy. I love Scorpios personally. Um, and they're really here to master um, intimacy and, and sexuality. Um, then we have Sagittarius. Well, they, Scorpio does control the, the sex chakra. Exactly. And Taurus controls the throat. Yeah. So the two are linked. Yes. Because the opposite signs of each other. Well, they're antipodes, exactly. Antipodes, yeah. exactly. I always say antipodes. It's a nice word. Antipode is a great word. You know, I was just in Bora Bora at uh -huh. a wedding, and the whole island is shaped like an Ouroboros, mm -hmm. like a snake eating its yeah. tail. I'll show it to you with a dragon in the center of it, like mm -hmm. a dragon's egg. And it's the antipode of Egypt. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. See, I like the word antipode more because when you hear opposite, you think an opposite would be completely the other thing that has nothing to do. But like antipode is we're related, right? So like Taurus and Scorpio, for example, related, they're very similar, but they're operating in a completely different way. I, it's almost like a conscious and a subconscious or, a, you know, like your persona and your shadow. Exactly. Right. And even for That's me, why I think every constellation needs to have its opposite pairing because yes. it's part of the same one. Yes. That's why, for Ophiuchus, there has to also be Orion. Yes. This makes perfect sense. The antipode. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we have Sagittarius, which is the philosopher. Mm -hmm. Though, honestly, Sagittarius is really like fuck around and find out in my book. I don't know if you have many. Oh, yeah. Sagittarius Sherman is kind is of famous. Sagittarius. Yeah, they're kind of famous for being a little bit like, I guess like that. Yes. Fuck around and find out. Yeah. Yeah. I a lot of playboys too. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Not the person I just named. I don't know him like that. But yeah, Sagittarius <laughs> is because I just felt bad I had named someone. But Sagittarius is the philosopher. And then we have Capricorn, which I like to nickname the mean daddy of the Zodiac. But they just they just get shit done. They're business, methodical, um, work hard, great discipline, great work ethic. Again, it's an earth sign, right? So mm -hmm. it's in that family of Taurus and Virgos. Mm -hmm. We all kind of can be workaholics. Um, and it's the goat. I haven't been saying what these all are represented by, but there you go. It's the goat. And then we have Aquarius, which is the water bearer. And it's all about community and technology. It's kind of like the rebel of the Zodiac, right? Mm -hmm. They're very like unique individuals and mm -hmm. they know it. They're like, nobody's like me. I'm different. You know, that's very like Aquarius. Um, and then we have Pisces, which are considered the oldest um, of the Zodiac. They're the old souls. They're all about mysticism and spirituality and oneness and like bringing everything together. I kind of feel like Pisces is all the signs put together, just like thrown in there. Right. And if you look at the house systems, Pisces represents the 12th house and the 12th house is like everything that didn't make it in houses one through 11 kind of ends up in that 12th house, which is the subconscious realm. Right. So Pisces is very much the subconscious as well. It's all the absorption then too. Yeah. It's like absorption reflection. Yeah. Like black versus white. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and again, they're like the mystics, right? And then... Maybe the yin-yang. Yeah. Like the two fish. Yeah. And it, well, it's represented by the two fish. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we have Aries, which is the the um, the ram. I must have the bull because I was looking at you. <laughs> and Aries is all about initiating. It's what starts the zodiac. They're fire. They're all about getting it done. They're... Um, 
really fun and exciting energy i find like where capricorn is more this grounded energy aries is like let's go let's get it done let's move quick um they're definitely the quickest in the zodiac and then after aries we have taurus which is you it's the bull tauruses are reliable and methodical it's actually kind of a little bit of a uh, four energy like we were talking about um their downside is they're stubborn but you know the taurus is um really destined for success again it's like it's got that earth energy but the, the taurus will move slowly and methodically and it's like your life trajectory just gets bigger the more you mature right so your best work hasn't even been done yet it you're gonna get there even later and later in life right and then after that we have gemini which is the twins they have a little bit of jekyll and hyde energy because there's two sides to gemini's right so um, I don't know if you have any Gemini's in your life, but they usually no, have, I mean, I have a Gemini moon though. Oh, well, there you go. Mm -hmm. So you probably can feel that there are two very distinct sides to you, which actually given your background makes sense that you're this very innovative spiritual person, but you're also, you know, come from a more of like a corporate mm -hmm. background in a way. Uh, but they're extremely brilliant, extremely witty, probably the most brilliant minds like Gemini's are so quick-witted it's unreal very very brilliant um and then we have you know amber khan no she's an astrologist is she a gemini she's a gemini yeah oh nice very quick-witted yeah there's they're really fun to have a conversation <clears throat> with they're fun to have at a party too mm -hmm. very good oh, at she's socializing. definitely fun to have at a party yeah and then we have cancer cancer's the nurturer they're kind of like a six energy they're ruled by the moon so they're pretty moody very intuitive they're like little crabs they like to like hide out in their shell and then come out when they feel like it um but very nurturing and very home-based uh cancers are always very connected to their home and their family um and then after that we got leos honestly i love leo that's probably like one of my favorite signs they're all about being heart-centered they're the lion they're the king right mm -hmm. they're extremely artistic <clears throat> they're kind of like the the star of the show like whenever a leo is around it's like they're always kind of oh yeah yeah totally. they're the ones shining the brightest and, okay you go you know i love a good leo a lot of people don't like them i love them i love, I them. love them too um a lot of people don't like leos because they think they're like vain but i i love the energy of a good leo where they're like i know i'm hot and i'm amazing i'm like you go yes totally. with that confidence mm -hmm. right so yeah leos are very confident so i kind of went off on a tangent there i try to make it as short as possible it's okay this is cliff notes version by the way people we could write <laughs> books on each of these signs you have. yeah <clears throat> i'm just trying to make this as like quick and entertaining so what do you think the next dimension of astrology and numerology might be mm. so because everything right now is going to a higher degree of both simplicity and complexity at the same time yeah uh gene keys was something that was very powerful for me yeah have you gotten yeah. into that much i've got richard I, rudd and i are good friends and, and oh amazing uh, really love his work and he and i were working together to try to figure out how we could apply a mathematical relationship to mm -hmm. it all and i think we found a way mm. to do it which is interesting i'll share it with you after it's a longer discussion we won't go into but what do you think about kind of like the next layer of what's going to come next because as consciousness expands yeah it will inevitably lead to other new ways that will also represent that expansion you know it's interesting i was just talking to someone who's also a profession, professional numerologist. And he was saying, he's like, I've tracked everything. He's, he's also like us, like loves to track just everything and anything. And he's told me, he's like, I think that numerology, astrology, all of these tools are going to be taught in school systems by 2049. And I thought that was just a really, really interesting idea to kind of sit with. But I do think the future, like we were talking about is merging science with spirituality so i think that these tools numerology and astrology are going to become more mainstream i i'm seeing it already and i think within that we're going to be able to talk about things that are a bit more complex than we do now like we were just talking before about asteroids like i love mm -hmm. talking about asteroids yeah. That's, you showed me this chart yeah yeah <laughs> which you freaked me out because i'd never seen this chart that included all the asteroid placements yeah yeah and then like i looked at the and chart like, oh and i'm God, like wait sense. my chart is a freaking metatron's cube yeah yeah are you kidding me yeah so, and I, i'm like where did this come from and you're like oh no because i knew it already had the the rectangle but i'm like 
what are all these other ones? And you're like, oh, those are asteroid placements. And if yeah, you're not yeah. doing asteroids, yeah. what, what are you doing with your life? Yeah, what are you doing with your life if you don't know asteroids? They're, I, lo I love a good asteroid. I just do. They're so incredibly specific, like so specific. Like um, Hygieia, for example, tells you about your health in this lifetime. Like it, it's mind-blowing. We we'll look at it when we're done. Holy but crap. Um, I think we're going to be able to talk about things like that because once people have more of a like a basis to go off of, then there's more to jump off from, right? So I think we're we're gonna be able to pull in more complexity. Um, and even with numerology, numerology is infinite. You know, I talk about the life path, the life destiny, and the personal year cycles the most because I think if you know those three numbers, you can change your life. Like I've done it, I've seen clients do it. Like they're it's so powerful just knowing those three. But you can go even deeper and it gets more nuanced. But I also want to be aware that sometimes when you talk about things a little too deep, you lose people, right? So I think, again, the more that we have the basis of understanding, the more people are going to be open to, to learning even more, right? Even the Gene Keys. Yeah. Um, I know that Richard worked with uh, Ra, mm -hmm. with, yeah, uh, who is the person who brought human design into existence. And again, like a lot of people I know who love human design don't like Gene Keys. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because Gene Keys is almost more in depth in a way. Yeah, very intricate, all those sequences, right? But I think that people are going to be more um, into that as, again, consciousness is expanding. And again, Pluto and Aquarius is like, everyone's going to be letting their freak flag fly. And, you know, people are going to really be able to innovate in spaces that they weren't be able, they weren't able to before. So, you know, this beginning of this year, we saw on New Year's Eve, they had put out this order in Hawaii and nobody's allowed to use fireworks and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then you saw the video on Instagram probably that showed everybody blowing up fireworks <laughs> in Hawaii. It was like a big F you. Of course, yeah. Right. So that was almost emblematic to me of like, okay, we're definitely in this year of rebellion. Yeah. And it's not just a year, but it's a long cycle because it's yes. Pluto. In Aquarius, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a big shift. Last time it happened like this was, you know, the time of 1775. Yeah. So what do you think is going to happen with this election coming up? Oh, man. <laughs> uh, oh, God. Is it going to be some kind of weird rebellion? What's going to go down? I, I think people are rebelling against the status quo. I think setting politics aside even... Um, I think you're even seeing like Germany just proposed a four day work week. I think people woke up during lockdowns and were like, why am I living this life that I'm living where I'm just kind of existing to work all the time and I'm not even passionate about what I'm doing. Like humans are not meant to be living in this way, right? Like our society is sick. It is not healthy. And this reverberates out in so, so, so many ways. And I think that again, consciousness has expanded to a point where people are aware of this and now it's time for changes to be made yeah. regarding what's going to happen that is so hard to say regarding the election because we are in this money and power year wait what is and, donald trump's life path oh my goodness i think he's either a 22 or a four wow so he's if he's a 22 then he's a mega builder yeah yeah <clears throat> yeah and what about no. what about joe biden Oh, I actually don't know. I've never, I've never decoded him, but you know, in the Maya, cause in the Maya, there are 260 glyphs. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're right next to each other in the Maya. Right. Really interesting. They're like the same, like one kin number off. So yeah, that's a whole. So other. what are you in the Mayan one? I'm a world bridger, self-existing and, and you're I a Skywalker. A, I'm a Skywalker. What does it mean to be a world bridger? And what does it mean to be a Skywalker? Well, world bridger <laughs> my mind teacher is probably gonna <laughs> get upset when I say this I'm always like I'm here to die but the world bridge represents death right so they're here to actually in the Mayan times if you were if you were a world bridger they were are you really like the grim reaper just like yeah basically <laughs> because I'm in all black some numerology you're like yeah I'm actually <laughs> yeah I, I got rid of the sickle you yeah, know yeah, it was exactly. too hard to carry around um but yeah, the world bridger, we're here to bridge worlds. Actually, a lot of uh, famous musicians are world bridgers, like John Mayer, Keith Urban, Dwayne Allman. Um, These are all guys that had relationships that died. 
Really? Major ones. Oh, yeah. Oh, I didn't know John did. Oh, um, yeah. Well, John Mayer? Yeah. Wasn't he with Katie? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought you meant like literal death. Keith but Urban. Yeah, so mm. world bridgers um, are here to bridge worlds, like taking two things that don't seem like they make sense and bringing them together. Um, they come from Mars. Skywalkers also come from Mars. And that is the karma that we bring according to the Maya, right? So our karma on the planet has to do with power and war, really. Yeah, I know, right? So Elon Musk is actually a world bridger, which is funny because he's obsessed with going to Mars, <laughs> right? I swear, I think we're going to go there and, and there's going to be like a video camera that goes, they go into some cave and they'll find some placard that says, you know, Elon Musk yeah, was here, was here. And, and, you know, this will be like 2032. Yeah. And they'll find something that was like the first placard or something like that. That's yeah. going to be like from some future point that just came back on a loop. Yeah. Be kind of wild. Yeah. I mean, well, maybe, oh man, no, I was going to say something about time, but we're going to get really off topic. Okay. The last thing I'll say, cause you asked Skywalker is the complement to the world bridger. So, Skywalkers and world bridgers come from Mars. And I believe George Lucas is either a Skywalker or a world bridger, which is interesting because Skywalker. That's why he called it Skywalker, probably. Mm -hmm. He must have known yeah. about that. He had so much esoteric stuff in the Star Wars series. It's a deeply spiritual series. The Jedi, that's the name of the council for the Arcturians. Really? Oh, yeah. Did he know that? <laughs> Who Maybe. <the> heck? <laughs> I mean, Jed Pillar, it's all about Maybe. the Jed. Yeah. Right? Wow, <laughs> yeah. It's about the Jed. So, I mean, he had all these symbologies there. Now, Skywalker is the Mayan. There's probably, yeah. there probably is a whole new numerology that's for 5D. It's yeah. probably hidden in just this, you know, the work of George Lucas. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, a lot of these stories, because I'm, I'm quite into sci-fi and fantasy, and I'm very obsessed with Lord of the Rings. I talk about it all the time. But it is the most spiritual story. Do you have like pointed ears? Because you could rock that too. Yo, when I was a kid, that was like my dream. I was like, why can't I be an elf in Rivendell? And my parents were like, it doesn't exist. I'm like, but it must because it was on the TV. Like, I was like convinced. But yeah, I mean, that would definitely be my goal. But it's a lot of these are just deeply, deeply spiritual. Um, yeah, Skywalker, you're here to walk the sky and be a visionary. Yeah. Hmm. So it's so interesting. We think that all of these things that happen to us are just the accumulation of our choices. Mm. And we think that those choices are the choices that are made here on earth. Mm -hmm. And maybe what we call destiny is really just the free will of our higher selves that got to choose the avatar and choose the entire experience. I think that... I think that these codes that we're talking about, like numerology and astrology and the Maya, that's one third of the picture. Like that's like your blueprint, right? Mm -hmm. That's like your jumping off point. Mm -hmm. And then I think we have one third karma. So some sort of energy that binds we us together. Carry with us. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And then I think the other third of that picture is free will. So for example, your life path one. You're a leader, you're an innovator. And I'm sure throughout your lifetime, even when you did not want to be leading, you were thrust into leadership positions. So, but you could have chosen not to. You could have said, you know what? I don't want to do this. I'm going to go live off grid on some farm. I don't want to lead anybody. Now, are you going to be happy? No. Is your life going to be out of alignment? Definitely. But you have the free will to choose. But what about that one scene? in the matrix mm -hmm. reloaded where Neo goes to visit with the Oracle. Oh yeah. She's yeah. sitting on the park bench uh -huh. and she says, take a seat, rest your feet. He says, no, 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 I'll stand. And then like 30 seconds later, he just like randomly sits down. Yeah. And he looks at her. He goes, I, I decided to sit. And yeah. she's like, mm -hmm. and he goes, but you knew I was going to decide to sit. Yeah. Well, do you think we don't have free will? I believe that all of it is pre-planned. Everything. Like Everything. even us sitting here right now, we already planned it. That's right. So we have no free will? We do because the choice that we have is in the context of our higher selves. That's mm. us too. Yes, We've yes, just yes. separated ourselves. If we're going to make a game, you never make a game that is going to have all of your powers in it. If you're omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent, there'd be no fun in that game. Yeah, exactly. It'd be boring. So what you do is you would limit yourself. Yeah. You'd cut your memory. You'd set the rules. 
and say, okay, the game is for you to find yourself and to capture as many different perspectives as you possibly can to expand your awareness and consciousness. It's a whole entirely different aim of the exercise than what you might possibly think. Yeah. So you wouldn't choose the easiest of things. You wouldn't choose, if you're a mountain climber, you're not going to choose to climb the hill behind your house. Yeah. You're going to choose to take on Everest or take on Kilimanjaro or take on one of these Mount Kailash or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And you would know that the greatest teachers in your life, just like in school, are the ones that pressed you and expected more from you than others. You don't even remember the easy teachers' names. <laughs> yeah. That makes sense. So if we start thinking about each experience in a different context, then we understand what is the true purpose of the philosopher's stone, which is that every experience that we have that's negative and difficult and shameful and all the things that we go through can be looked at in an entirely different context Mm. when you have the perspective that you chose it and that it led to this incredible heart opening because you realize that those things that were most difficult on you and most challenging actually expanded and grew you the most. Yeah. Well, I guess that ties back to earth being some sort of kind of, I mean, it, we've already discussed that we feel it's a simulation, but it's also kind of like a school. It's a spiritual for life simulation. To grow. Yeah. It's a exactly. spiritual life simulation. And the beautiful thing is, is that the one divides itself is what I believe into mm-hmm. the many simply for the joy of being able to perceive itself through all of our unique perspectives. Yeah. Each one of us, there's never been another person like you and there never will be another one exactly like you. Mm -hmm. So your knowledge that then leads to your feelings and emotions, the only thing real in this world are the things that you feel. Yeah. And that feeds an entire Akashic field of information so that the one consciousness Mm -hmm. can become more wise. Wow. Wow. By seeing the world through your eyes and feeling your emotions. Because isn't wisdom the ability to jump into at any given moment, any possible different perspective, mm-hmm. and being able to empathize with that pers- position and perspective? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. That's the ultimate philomath, the lover of learning, the lover of wisdom as philosopher. Yeah. Philosophia. Yeah. So I think that's really what we're here to do. And I, and I think learning how to just accept that path. Mm-hmm is one of the most powerful things we can do. So for me, I used to buck against it. You know, I'd be like, okay, I'm going to cut my own destiny. I'm going to make my own thing. And I'm going to (laughs) use my willpower, right? My Torian willpower. And I'm going to like, somehow, I may not get there in the beginning, but I will eventually win. Yeah, yeah. And I'll end up getting there through through my will. It's very Napoleon of you. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But just like Napoleon, you know what happened to Napoleon? Wasn't he stranded on an island? Yeah, he got kicked out of France, right? Yeah. <laughs> Sent to, to Elba, you know, uh-huh. and then, you know, he died on an island, Helena. But the the thing is, is before all that happened, he conquered Palestine. Yeah. He conquered Egypt. He was the great conqueror. 24 years old, he's the leader, the general of Isn't the Isn't that entire... wild to think about? Like when you read, like even looking at Marcus Aurelius, when you're reading some of... Same thing with another similar vibrational context is Alexander. Yeah. So similar situation. Very young. They um, were so young with so much wisdom. Julius Caesar. Same thing. Guess what? All three of them uh-huh. changed irrevocably when they went to the Great Pyramid. Of course. They spent the night in the Great Pyramid by themselves, all three. What? Really? It's all recorded in history. I didn't know that. each one of them came out of it completely changed. And guess what happened to Napoleon? What? He became a mathematician. After he spent the night in the pyramid? Mm Mm-hmm. But not before it? He discovered something that we call the Bonaparte theorem. I've never heard this. It is the theorem that shows that any size of triangle... Right? If you put an equilateral triangle mm-hmm. on each side of that scalene triangle or isosceles triangle, doesn't matter, and then connect the center points of those three equilateral triangles that are abutted up against the sides of the scalene triangle, mm-hmm. will make a perfect equilateral triangle. His choice was he didn't want to conquer anymore after he came back from Egypt. Uh-huh. But of course, the French were making a lot of money off of his conquering. Yeah. So they liked it. Yeah. Same thing with Julius Caesar. He came back, spent the night in the Great Pyramid, didn't want to conquer anymore either. He got killed shortly thereafter. 
Wait, this is what? Wait, haven't you spent the night in the pyramid? 17 times. 17 times? Mm -hmm. Okay, what was the first time like for you? Amazing. Uh, I <clears throat> Was that the most life-changing time? No, the second time was the most life-changing time. My Why? first time, I was there with a large group. I wasn't by myself. Yeah. Um, and I decided to go back. It was an amazing experience already, and I had a whole incredible experience after that. Uh, all of us, there were 50 of us, and Adam Rowe was with me, and we were laying on the Giza Plateau and looking up at the stars after we got out of the King's Chamber. We were just waiting for the other groups to come out. We could still hear them inside. It's like a giant speaker. Yeah. We could literally hear them. The pyramid's 13 acres in space, right? It's huge. Oh, I didn't realize it was that big. It's massive. So it's 756 feet each side. Yeah. So its perimeter is 3,024 feet. Mm-hmm. So we're laying on the on the um, on the stone, looking up at the stars, and then we start noticing all the stars are moving in formation. There are fifty of us out there. There were seventy five ships above above us. Oh, whoa! We all saw it. Oh my god! Did that feel like you were like having an acid trip or something? Yes, <laughs> like, and I was not like, on are acid. Are y'all seeing this? What's going on? Oh yeah, I have video of it too. Wow! And we're all like, what the? Wait, have you posted this online? No, I did not. I want to see this video because the video. It was such a full moon that night. It was such a full moon that you couldn't, the contrast wasn't enough to be able to see what we were seeing, but you could hear us talking all of us like, what the fuck? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, you can't believe this. And several people had individual visitations. It was an unbelievable experience. But I was so moved by it. Oh, I asked you about aliens earlier. Yeah, I was so moved. One, One thing I did notice is that when I came out of the Great Pyramid, my relationship with time changed. So okay. I could perceive different time dimensions. Wait, the first time or the second the time? The first time. Okay, so the first, first time, time, I went, time changed. I came out, I sat at the great step, and this Egyptian guy came up to me, and he starts telling me, mm. he's a fan, fantastic uh, person, a good friend of mine now, and he starts telling me that, um, he said, hey, can you heal people? And I was like, and I'd just been in the king's chamber. Yeah, I yeah. said, I, honestly, I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> You're like, maybe. I've never tried. I'm, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've never tried. And then he said, um, he said, my mother is sick. She has a bad heart. And somehow I could see his whole life. Like I'm sitting at the apex of the pyramid, mm-hmm. the great step in the grand gallery. And right behind me is where the king's chamber is. And I could see his whole life. And I said, no, your mother doesn't have a bad heart. She has a broken heart. Wow. And he's okay. like. Damn, yeah. He goes, what do you mean? And I said, well, your father died recently. Uh Uh-huh. And he said, yes, how did you know? Yeah. And I said, well, your brother was upset at you. You were upset at him. You had a big fight with your father before he died, only like six or nine months before. Yeah. And your mother wanted you to reconcile with your father. And your father beat you as a child and you don't understand why he beat you, but you always hated him for it. Yeah. And I said, the reason why he beat you is because he knew you were gay. Whoa. Okay, he you was went gay. deep. Wow. He was gay. He was fighting off the tendency of it, which happens yeah. you know, pretty often. And so he beat you for it. And, uh, and wow. he couldn't live with you being gay. And so you left the house and, and he was just like completely stunned. That and is I, and I said, and he died. so much information, by the way, yeah. to be picking up on. And yeah. it's so specific. It was so specific. So, so I said, had you been able to do stuff like that before, though? Oh, no. No. Oh, so this never. is just like one That was night. the first time. I could just all of a sudden see it. And then... And then total activation. Total activation. And then after that, um, there were... Because a lot of people heard about this. Yeah. Because he told people. He was like, that guy just like totally read my whole life. Like, not past life, but this life that he could verify. Yeah. And, and so I walked out of the pyramid and all the people that worked at the pyramid heard about this because he worked there too. And so they, every time I go there now, they know. Because every time I've gone, there's like major discoveries. We, we have massive yeah, discoveries yeah. in the pyramid. And so they've given me a key to the pyramid and everything. It's been a great experience. But then about 30 other people on the same trip, it was with Nassim Haramain, this is this group uh, called Resonance Foundation, asked me to do the same thing to look in their past to see where they had like a blockage Whoa. or something. And I did it to 30 other people on the trip. Wait, was that something that came online and was only available at that time? Or is that something you still can do? I can still do it. 
Whoa, oh my God. And then it turned into That's being able wild. to see past lives and everything. Yeah. So one of my friends asked me once I was at a Wait, retreat. Wait, this makes sense. Because you told me about certain people being reincarnated. Yeah. That's how, huh? That's right. So I've always oh. been able to see the future. Like yeah. I always had this uncanny knack to see the future. Like I would have a dream. I had a dream in, in when I lived in South Korea that my girlfriend at the time was involved in a car accident. She rolled the car. She was driving as a beige Toyota. I saw the license plate number and everything. I was in South Korea in the middle of the night. I wake up and I'm like, whoa, my girlfriend's going to crash in a car. Wow. Nine hours later, it happened. Oh, my God. So I've always been connected somehow. And I've always been able to pick trends in business. I'm a, I have a 80 patents or something. I, I'm an inventor. I create things. Yeah, yeah. And I just know how to tap into that frequency of what's coming. Yes. And there's massive change coming this year. Yeah. Massive. In yeah. financial systems and governments and all the, the institutions are going to start to really dissolve. Mm -hmm. Whether they be educational all the arbiters of what is truth and what is um, judgment. Yeah. Well, you know, what's interesting is that 2025 20, is a nine, universal year nine, which is ending. Completion. And mm -hmm. completion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. So so basically, <laughs> I, could, I could see always the future, but then from the time I went to the Great Pyramid, I could see the past. Wait, so then what? Okay. So Not my past, but other people's. What's interesting, though, is that what you just told me is incredibly profound. But you said that the second time was the one that was more powerful. So how could, like, The why? second time, the entire time I was on the alchemical journey, I was even teaching the path of alchemy. And there are, you know, these stages of alchemy, which start with Negredo, the blackening, and then you go into albedo, the whitening where people often confuse that with, you know, you're becoming enlightened. And then it's, it's, it's almost like a respite. And then you go mm -hmm. into the peacock. The peacock is the citronitas or the yellowing. Yeah. And it's like the, the wings of the peacock coming out and they've all got eyes on all over. Oh, them. yeah, yeah. Kind of like how they said angels apparently look. Yeah. So you're thinking of like Ophanim or the seraphim. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, and Naturally, yeah. Naturally. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> genau so. Genau. So, so then after that, <laughs> then you have the rubedo, which is the pelican. The pelican represents sacrifice. The pelican will tear off its own flesh to feed its children, right? It's Whoa. basically what it represents. Okay. But it also represents the marriage of the red king and the white queen. Okay. This is the alchemical union. Mm -hmm. When you meet your anima or your animus. Yeah. It's part of the process because you have to integrate some aspects of this other person into your life. Almost like a twin flame kind of thing? Kind of, yes, it is. And okay. it represents learning how to accept the different aspects of yourself. So the person you'll yeah. end up being attracted to will not be someone that you will normally think that you would be attracted to. Yes. It's going to be it's someone. It's what you need. It's what you need. Yes. It, it's it's like, you know, the, the dose of, of mushrooms. So some people yes. will say, you know, they'll say, you don't get what you need. You know, you don't get, you get what, what you want. want. You, you get, get what, what you need. need. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, that, I mean, uh, yeah, you see that a lot in, you know, when spiritual people talk about the twin flame journey. Oh, yes. Or I just read a book on soulmates was so fascinating it was just literally a bunch of crazy stories of how people get together um i'll have to tell you some of them later because they were just like out of this world but the woman was saying that like usually when you're when your real soulmate shows up when the person you're supposed to be with it is never what you think never like it's never like what you think they're gonna look like or what they do and it's like everyone has this idea in their head and it's like but that's actually not what's going to grow you the most. What's going to grow you the most is the thing that you're... And like, that's the whole purpose of Twin Flame Journey. Yeah. Right? Which is, it's going to take you on a roller coaster Yeah. of growth. Sounds exhausting. It is. Yeah. <laughs> it's exhausting. And there's that runner-chaser dynamic. <coughs> and mm. again, yeah. I, I don't think I've experienced the Twin Flame situation, but uh, some of my friends have it's told me... It's not easy. Yeah, some of my friends have told me they're on that journey, and I'm like, that doesn't sound fun. It, no, it never does. No. Um, well, there's a part of it. There's a part. It's like really good, you know, situations. There's certain aspects of it. It's like an Italian car. Uh, yeah. It reminds me of like an Italian car. When it's working. It's great. It's amazing. When it's broken, it's really broken. Yeah. I right? don't love Italian cars. Yeah. This is kind of the, I, the German. Flame Germany. Yeah, and, yeah. Then, and then the last stage is the Phoenix. 
Yes. It's all about the resurrection. When you come into union. Which is all about, well, you do come into union, Mm -hmm. but the union happens within yourself. Of course. Right. And so it's when you find the balance of masculine and feminine. Uh huh. And that's what the whole thing is. That's why the Great Pyramid represents the math of squaring the circle. The yeah. squares area, you know, can, or the squares uh, perimeter can equal the, the circle's circumference. So then this was your realization on the second time. So my second journey, I was in this path. And right before I left to go to Egypt, I was um, getting some bags out of a car and a big white, giant white egret bird landed right in front of me. Wait, what? So a white egret's like a Huron. No, yeah, yeah. But I meant you're getting bags out of a car like near the so airport? Random. Like No, no. I was I was at my in-laws house and I'm standing in the front yard and all of a sudden this giant white egret lands right in front of me. It's a Bennu bird, an Egyptian Bennu bird. Yeah, yeah. Lands right in front of me and I'd had a dream about this. Wow. And it landed right in front of me. But there were five birds that flew out of a volcano in my dream that were all different colors of Hurons, but they were Bennu yeah. birds. Or what they call the wajet mm-hmm. in uh, in Egypt. So, this bird stood and looked at me. And it was big, <clears throat> and then right as I grabbed my phone, it turned around and flew away. Right, and I'm like, mm. and I grabbed. I got <laughs> You're a like photo everyone, of it, I saw this away. crazy bird. I got this photo. It's a huge you. wingspan. Yeah. And everything it was oh, crazy. You know, several feet. It was big, and um, and so I knew going to Egypt the next day. I was going to Israel first. So I went to Israel for a week. It was a totally random trip because everything there was all about the merger of masculine and feminine. You know, you've got the inverted triangle and the triangle. Yeah. Which starved David. Yeah. So we stop. You know, I end up going to Capernaum. I go to Peter's house, which is three octagons inside of each other. Yeah. Right? Made of stone. And then from there, we stopped at this the, to get gas. And the guy's like, hey. I was with like 40 CEOs from Orange County, all members of YPO. And, <laughs> and I was the host. Of, I was one of the hosts of the trip. <laughs> So the guy says, hey, this is, uh, we're going to get some gas. It's going to take like 45 minutes to put gas out the bus before we go into Jerusalem. Uh, if anyone wants to get baptized, you can get baptized. This is the place where Jesus got baptized. Okay. So you got baptized. So I'm like, I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> so <clears throat> I was already on a very spiritual path. So I didn't think everyone else could do it. Everyone else ended up doing it. Yeah. And, you know, you're when in Rome type thing. So we went and got baptized. And I, I was there. It was a very sacred experience for all of us actually and but in particular for me and uh, i knew something was happening and changing and all week long i was drawing in my notebook alpha omega mm-hmm. alpha omega i could not figure out why i kept drawing it the geometric relationships of it and everything and then i went to jerusalem on the last night we had a big dinner in the cave of zedekiah mm-hmm. zedekiah's cave which is under the dome of the rock okay and uh, it's the cave where they actually took all the stone the quarry from uh, to make Solomon's temple. Oh, okay. So this is the place where the Ark wow. of the Covenant was supposed to have been hidden for a long time. Yeah. So this place was this huge cave <clears throat> with these long tables with huge crystal candelabras on it. It looked like an Illuminati style dinner or something. It was a state dinner because it was actually hosted in Jordan. Yeah. And uh, and so I was supposed to give a speech that night. So instead, of course, being you know the explorer adventurer that I would like to think of myself as. I asked, so where's the bathroom? And they're like, oh, it's over there. <clears throat> there was a harpist there and everything. The, it was so random, right? Yeah, what? <laughs> so I, like picturing this, I like, jumped huh? this fence okay. yeah. and crawled deep into this cave. Okay. And it said, do not enter, do not enter. And I didn't put my phone on, light on or anything like that until I got deeper in the cave. And I recorded the whole thing. And I went deep into the cave to try to find where the ark had been hidden. I knew it wasn't there anymore. Yeah. I thought that I might be able to find a place. Yeah. So I get deep, deep, deep into the cave and I find about half a mile and I find this point on the floor where it looked like there were steps to an almost like an altar type thing. But instead of it being limestone, like the entire rest of the cave, it was all turned to quartz crystal. Whoa. And I got it all in video. Yeah, yeah. I can show you later. And then I look down at the floor with my video and I see Alpha Omega carved in the floor. Whoa. Well, I mean, you have that prophetic... Part of you right. so <laughs> got activated, like, so hey. Whoa, that's trippy. Yeah. I later found out that earlier that night, the Royal Arch Freemasons had gone there every year since 1969. They stopped in 1948. They did it all the way from 1869, all the way until 1948. Why'd they and stop? And then it became, well, because it became part of the Jordan 
side oh, and there was like okay. a dispute yeah, over yeah, the whole yeah, thing at yeah. the time. And they started up again in 1969, the year I was born. And they have a commemoration to that spot because they believe that was a spot where the Ark of the Covenant had been hidden. Wow. And, and so that's why it's carved in the floor, Alpha Omega. Wow. So I, um, you know, I, I didn't know that at the time. I found out two, three years later that that's where it was. Yeah. And it happens every year on that date, which was May 6th. Wow. May 6th. Tourist season. Yeah. Tourist season. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Your season. So then I, I went to Egypt with a group of 12. So out of the 40 people, I took 12 with me to Egypt. And uh, we went to the king's chamber, you know, and I had, the, I rented the pyramid and it was all good. And You can rent the pyramid? It's not on Airbnb, but yes, you yeah. can. <laughs> I've Could done it imagine? several times now. I didn't know you could rent the pyramid. Yes, I have the concierge. <laughs> this is thrilling. <laughs> yes, you can. And, and so I, uh, I had one of my friends, you know, laying in the sarcophagus and I looked down at the rim of the sarcophagus and something took me back to a memory. Okay. And I remembered standing at the same place, looking down at the sarcophagus and watching this device press Alpha Omega into the rim. Whoa. In and the it pyramid? Was the green blue light in the pyramid. I was there when it was pressed. I was standing right Whoa. there. Whoa. It was the green blue. So that was, was that like a laser that they were? I, I don't know what it was. It was yeah, some yeah. sort of scalar directed energy or something. I don't know what it was, but it pressed. You know, because you can't chip the sarcophagus. It's made of 55% quartz crystal. If you yeah. try to take a hammer to that, it's going to shatter. Yeah, it's not going to work. And it's more dolerite, so the most brittle stone. So I remembered Alpha Omega being put there, but in my memory, there were only five people in the room, including me. But and you were a 12. I was a 12. Yeah. And one was laying in the sarcophagus. I was in a totally different time space. Was it kind of like you jumped into a past life yes. kind of thing? 100%. But you like were actually there. I was actually there. So then time collapsed into that 2D and you fell into a That's portal. right. So yes. I'm in this somehow this different place. I remember it like I'm in it. And then I came out of that place. Wow. And I looked down at the sarcophagus exactly where I remembered it would be. And I saw the light flickering on it and I'm like, oh my God, there's an Alpha Omega on the rim right there. Wow. And I knew that moment that my life was gonna be different forever. Wow. I knew it. So I went and grabbed the Egyptologist and they're like, did you make that? Whoa. And I'm like, no, but it's really hard to see. If you put a light directly over it, you can't see it. You have to have it at its side. So it's a very, that's why everyone missed it. Everyone missed it. And then um, I went to the pyramid again the second night and everyone else had left. I went by myself this time. Uh -huh. And I laid in the sarcophagus and I had an experience where the portal in the ceiling opened, flower of life, and I went yeah. out and I was gone for five hours. Yeah. And it was one of the most amazing experiences of my life. I've actually had, it was up until that time was the most amazing experience. But since then I've done it, I've done more significant things wow but it's been the most and does everyone who comes with you they all have significant like life-changing moments or is this kind of specific to you and your energy and, i mean every time i've gone everyone would say that it's been a specific life-changing wow type do other people kind of report the same things that oh, you've yeah. gone through like uh, psychic sometimes, gifts turning sometimes on. more significant uh, we had wow on one of the trips we were all in there and um literally the whole ceiling turned to the sky. It was transparent. What? And everyone And I was saw like, that? oh shit, are we all going to go out? You know, what the oh hell is going God. on? Oh my God, wow. Several other people saw it. And it was, it was wild. Sounds and then my like last trip. Sounds like you're taking drugs. Sounds like an acid trip. Yeah, this there is was so no wild. Acid. No, yeah, I know. But that's what's so crazy is you're having such like altering experiences, but completely sober. For me, when I walk in there, I see the walls as totally entirely alive yeah they are memory devices where you can store your thoughts and memories and they have been stored with thoughts and memories into the walls and all the astrological symbols of the daycon are embedded in the walls as petroglyphs yeah of course. and we found them yeah so and i've just presented on them and i can tell you that it's a it is not what we think it is mm. The pyramids or? The pyramids. The pyramids are all about spiritual life ascension. Yeah. It's a spiritual life ascension stargate. Mm -hmm. That's are, what I believe it is. Well, it would make sense too because there are pyramids that have been found all over the world. So there's, that would be, 
And they all match Orion's belt. Yeah, and it would be interesting if they're all Stargates. I believe they are. Yeah. So that's why I just got back from Mexico. I was measuring all the pyramids because I found the musical relationship for all the pyramids. And Mm. that relationship works for all the pyramids, not just in Egypt, everywhere. It's it's a song. They're making, I told you that the, the Great Pyramid is the octave double and the unison note. And it's also the diminished fifth. Wow. But, but the other two pyramids, Khafre is the perfect fifth and it's inverted pairing, the perfect fourth. Yeah, yeah. And then the third pyramid is the major third and the minor sixth. And that's... So that's eight out of the 13 musical intervals of an octave. Yeah. So then where are the other notes in another place called Abu Rawash and Saqqara? So the exact slope angle of Saqqara pyramid matches the major second and the minor seventh. What? And the slope angles in Abu Rawash for the Jed and the Jed satellite pyramids match exactly the missing other notes in the overall scale. And this is eight wow. kilometers north of, of the Giza Plateau. It represents the pineal and pituitary glands. But have you found even pyramids like in Mexico? Yeah, they all match It's the it. same. They're all matching it. Wow. They all match This is it. so mind-blowing when you think about it. Like, it is. what? This is it so is. crazy. This is the shit that like gets me jazzed. I'm like, what? Yeah. Like, what? Yeah. This is so crazy. But that's and why I'm blowing. inviting you to be on our team. Yeah. Because this is now the greatest <laughs> adventure of all time. <laughs> You're like a, a modern day Indiana Jones, but cosmic. Cosmic. Yeah, we all are. Yeah. So we just finished. Oh my God, and your hat. Day. That's right. It's I a little Indiana this. Jones-ish. It is Indiana Jones yeah. hat. Yeah. I brought it because it was pouring rain today. Oh, wow. But so this is, we are on the greatest mystery hunt of all time. Well, I do think that we're living in the most exciting time. We are. Ever. Like, I know a lot of people are like, oh my God, like everything's falling apart. Like, what does it all mean? I'm like, y'all, things might look like they're falling apart, but it's only so that greater things can come together. Like, I really do believe that. And I think the greatest discoveries ever, like in this you know, it's all happening. I really do think it's all happening again. Even the stuff that you've talked about, I'm just like, how is this? <laughs> is... Like, again, people have wondered about the pyramids for so long and you're literally uncovering it right yep. now. Yep. We are hundred percent. We are. That's just, and it's so all wild. in my second season of codex, yeah. which people are going to be totally mind blown over. Um, yeah. you know, the I mean, first I'm season was good, but the, the second season Watch the first season, though, so you could be up to speed for the second. Yeah. And, like, be ready for it because it's going to literally blow the lid off so much stuff. I feel like the thing... So then now that you have this information, specifically with the the notes and music, what do you you do with that? You know, when I first figured out it was music, I was like, don't even tell me it's going to be like Close Encounters of the Third kind of be... Dun, 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 bum, bum. (laughs) I was like, that'll be crazy, right? So it is... It is music, the whole thing, the entire scale. And it's not a 12-note scale. It's a 24-note scale. Okay. So we have a quarter-tone scale. So all of the indigenous peoples have a scale that is called pentatonic. Yeah. So the pentatonic, the pentatonic scale, scale would be scale. like, you know, the temptations. Dun, 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 dun. That's pentatonic scale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have a 12-note scale, which then doesn't incorporate all of the pentatonic scales. And their differentiations, but when you have a 24 note quarter tone scale, all of them are captured. Yeah. That's why the Egyptians use 24 note quarter tone, so do the Vedic yeah. musicians. Well, and a lot of Middle Eastern, oh, yeah, the sitar, but mm-hmm. a lot of also Middle Eastern music, they're using that as well. Exactly. Yeah. So, and all time is based off of this. Yeah. Because time is a 24,000 year clock. Yes. And each of the thousand years is a different note. Mm-hmm. So, we could turn music into a clock yeah and, we and that's have. also kind of like what the astrology <clears throat> was too that's what we did so exactly. tony mazzotti i i designed it and tony mazzotti actually programmed it and now you can find the 24 uh note quarter tone scale embedded so that each of the notes of each hour each minute each second change right with times you can listen to what time sounds like in its progression and you can listen to um you can see the colors of it too yeah. So there's oh a goodness. there's a light based clock as well. He made it and it's like gone nuts. <laughs> I'm like mind blown over here. <laughs> You're gonna love it. Because it's just another way again, we start off by saying that geometry is the music we enjoy yeah. with our eyes. Yes. That Same makes thing sense. with light. 
Yeah. Light is also music that we enjoy with our eyes. And guess what? Everything can be measured through numbers and math. <laughs> Boom. So <geeky. laughs> it all comes back full circle. That's so, why I'm always... So welcome to our Ascensors team. <laughs> yeah. It's going to blow your mind. I'm telling you. And I knew, I was just watching your stuff. I'm like, okay, she is someone who is sitting at this intersection, this nexus point. Yeah. Between left and right brain. Yeah. And that's exactly what we look for. Yeah. Well... <laughs> it's like the X-Men. Yeah, it's like getting initiated into the Avengers. Okay. It's totally what it is. I dressed for the part. Yeah, you really did. Ready to fight crime. You know, we had all these we all all these superhero type characters in uh, Egypt with us in in December. Yeah. And it was amazing. And yeah. everyone got along so well. It was like listening to a symphony. Yeah. And there was a moment when we were there. So this is a, the probably the most profound moment I've had in the pyramid and it happened on my last trip. December. In December. And it's February 1st. I was standing today. in there. It was on 12 So recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was standing in there on 12 12, and we reached a frequency together as a group in there that I literally, everyone was weeping and wow. everyone. And it was like we achieved a angelic frequency. Wow. I've never experienced anything like that. Everybody was just bawling, crying. The music was off planet. Yeah. And it was like choirs of angels singing in there. It was the most incredible experience I've ever had. Wow. It's like when I when I'm hearing you say that, I'm trying to imagine it, but it's one of those things that you just you can't unless you're there. You have to experience it. Yeah. But you will. Yeah. Through this association, you're gonna get invited. So you're gonna come. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm down to go spend the night in a pyramid. You will do <laughs> that it. you're renting. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> because you have the key. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, it's a good time. I'm telling you, you will never, ever forget it. Yeah. And it, it will... Well, it's such a... I mean, everyone knows about the pyramids in Egypt. To go spend the night in there is... I mean, I can't even... And nobody sleeps. There's no sleeping. Yeah. We, we are do doing Do you just feel so wired it. when you're in there, though? Yeah. I mean, there's a thing that you do right before you go into the king's chamber. There's an antechamber, and I will find this... All you have to do is find this note, mm. and you just go... Mm -hmm. And then the whole thing, it's like a bath. You're taking a frequency bath in there. And the whole thing just goes, wah. It's like yeah. so loud. It's so loud. And you're going to be like, what the hell just happened? That's so crazy. You lay in the sarcophagus. It does the same thing. But it's like you take this shower of frequency before yeah, you go yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a very It's like a sound place. healing. It's a sound healing. Yeah, exactly. Well, that makes sense. It, it's also set up in that way. Well, and what's really cool, too, is that I had predicted in season one that there would be a new chamber at the throat chakra line of Vitruvian Man, Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man, because that was a cipher yeah, yeah. for us. And just last it's week, like da Vinci they, code. it was, that's right, it's the real Da Vinci Code. Yeah. It was published that the exact place that I predicted in the show, which was a few years ago now, is exactly where the next chamber is that's been discovered. Are you going to be able to go into it? They're trying to figure out a way to notch out the chevrons at the original entrance. It's problematic because this is an iconic yeah. thing. And they're going to have to cut a one half meter by one half meter hole. And I talked to the Minister of Antiquities, Dr. Waziri, about this on my last trip. And he's like, yeah, it's really tough. When he goes, I have to make the decision on this. But they're, they're going to get in. And what's behind the corridor, they already found and put an endoscopic camera in. It's the same shape as the throat chakra, by the way. Yeah. The entire corridor well, is the course. exact shape of the throat chakra. Yeah. So it's a pentagonal diamond, diamond pentagon. But at this point, does anything surprise you? No. Yeah. Because at the this... next chamber is the metathrone. Oh my goodness. Well, that's the thing though. At this point- The our throne beyond. Yeah. At this point in our conversation, I'm just like, Natalie. <laughs> of course. That's right. <laughs> right? But of course. So I feel like after all your discoveries and everything that- you've experienced like nothing is too far-fetched you know yeah. i do i do find that though i feel that even like with my own life the past year i'm like life is so magical like every day feels magical and i feel like nothing's too far-fetched i'm like yeah cool of course that could probably exist why not the but it's only, exciting the only things that are real are the feelings that we feel yeah and the only obstacles that we face that are 
problematic and real for us are the ones that we consistently believe in that then turn into those feelings of disempowerment. Yeah. When we let ourselves go from that way of thinking, everything shifts. Yeah. If you want to change the world around you, change how you perceive it and change how you perceive yourself. Yeah. And I feel like that's always what, you know, spiritual teachers and the stoic philosophers were always saying. Everything is just our perception. So yeah. then you can make it what you hope to see. And maybe even that change and exactly. shift in you was what you decided before you came in the context of before that never was because there's only now. Exactly. Yeah, because <laughs> time is an illusion. <laughs> exactly. Isn't that interesting to think like what if you were born and you weren't taught time as we know it? Where it's, you know, 60 minutes and one hour, 24 hours, one day, seven days. Like imagine if you weren't taught that, like how you would experience time. I believe that within the next 20 years, there will be people born that will not die. Wow. Okay, I'm down with it. Yeah. So they'll hit the age of 35 and, and that'll that's become it. the age of the adult. Whoa. Get ready. There's a big shift happening right now. And I think we all feel it. We don't know all the implications of it, but it also feels very exciting. Mm. But it also feels very ominous. Yeah. Because for the light to become more bright, we have to have a backdrop of more darkness. Exactly. Just like Lord of the Rings. Yes. You love Lord of the Rings. I love Lord of the Rings so Is much. Is it a coincidence that Gandalf the Grey becomes Gandalf the White? Of course not. Right as the orc army is getting you know, ready for war? Yeah. He came back. That's the right. turn of the tides. So there's yeah. always going to be the darkness that needs the light. Mm. The darkness needs the light as much as the light needs the dark. Of course. You cannot have one without the other. Darkness is not the absence of light. Mm -hmm. It's the opposite condition of it. Yeah. The wall behind you is black. It's not the absence of light. Yeah. It's the absorption of it. Yeah. So we have a very different viewpoint on what reality is and our concept of what time is is this concept of linearity which it is not yeah we will soon understand that light does not travel photons don't travel they reflect along a wave perturbation mm -hmm. of energy just like when you go to a football stadium and you do the wave you stand up you have on yeah. excitation and off excitation you didn't travel if you're a photon you just went up and down yeah just like if there's a tidal wave in Japan and there's a big massive wave that comes as a result of it all the way to California, Oregon, and Washington. It's not like the water molecules that end up here are the ones from Japan. Yeah. They just went up and down. It was yeah. the wave energy that came through. Same thing with the etheric field. You have on excitation, off excitation, just like an LED screen. Yeah. This makes sense. Light doesn't actually travel. So when we start to understand this, you start to realize as well that the constructs that we believe in that put limitations on space-time travel because of great distance mm -hmm. can actually be collapsed into a second dimension through an Einstein-Rosen bridge. Yeah. It's mathematics. And that's the portal. And that's the portal. And then you drop through. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right at the same time. And scene. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here with me. Really appreciate it. I'm excited me. to have you contribute also to our research team. Uh, I think you're going to absolutely freaking love it. You're going to go nuts over <laughs> this. And um, thank you for doing what you're doing and mm -hmm. raising the awareness of all these things because I really do believe that what you're teaching is how we can all access our operator's manual. Yeah. In the matrix. I see it that way too. It's our cosmic blueprint, you know? And again, like it's the most powerful tool for reflection and growth you know and it's nice to be able to put something outside of you and be like oh my life path one okay let me just like take take out my emotions around this and just okay i'm a leader archetype let me play with that and when you play with your archetypes and you play with your codes and you actually come into alignment things just click it's wild it's so it's so valuable so thank you for having me on thank you and yeah it's nice to see Someone else who's obsessed, as obsessed with patterns as I am. <laughs> Good to have you here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and <Bye. Cut>. see. <laughs>